In lecture 12, we're going to take a look at the graphs of other trig functions, including the, can the tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and secant functions, in much the same way that we looked at the trig function uh, graphs for sine and cosine. So we just want to be able to identify what these graphs will look like, be able to graph basic functions um, without too many additional parameters involved. Now let's take a look by just doing a value table, much like we did with the sine and uh, cosine function in the earlier lecture. We're going to go back and use the definition of trig functions, plugging in different values for um, x. Remember that we let x be in terms of radians radians. So whenever we plug in negative pi over 3, we're thinking in terms of a function um, uh, tangent of the angle negative pi over 3, which is down here. right? And on the unit circle, that point where it intersects that graph is the point uh, goes over an x direction of I saw, what's it negative 60 degrees so goes down um, sorry goes right one half and goes down negative square root of three over two so this value right here if you plug in negative pi over three the tangent is going to be negative square root of three over two divided by one half which gives me a negative square root of three when you invert and multiply okay now, instead of going through that with every single one, you can actually refer back to the section where we learned how to find the values of these trig functions, but let's just write them, them, write them down pretty quick. This is going to be negative 1. Pi over 6 is going to end up being uh, uh, negative square root of 3 over 3. And by the way, this is actually approximately, just so we can do this in decimal form, negative 1.7. This is approximately equal to negative 0.58. And if we plug in 0, right, the 0 value right here is going to give me 0 because it's 0 over 1. Then this becomes positive 0.58, positive 1, and positive 1.7. It's the same values continuing on upward, right? This was square root of 3 over 3. This is uh, square root of 3 right there. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph from negative pi over 2. You may wonder, why did I start at negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2? Well, it goes back to the domain of the function tangent, which we learned about in the definition of the tangent function, but in particular that if you're straight down, which happens to be the negative pi over 2 direction, your coordinates here turn out to be um, 0 comma negative 1, and when you try to do um, tangent, which remember, of course this may have been helpful earlier, but tangent of x is the or tangent of theta, I should say, is the uh, y-coordinate over the x-coordinate. And if you try to do negative 1 over 0, you divide by 0 and you end up being undefined. So there actually is no value of tangent over here at negative pi over 2, and actually there is also no tangent value at positive pi over 2. However, at um, negative pi over 3, which is about two thirds of, or sorry, uh, yeah, two thirds of the way there. You are at negative 1.7, 1, 2, so negative 1.7 is about right here. If you are at pi over 4, which happens to be halfway, sorry, I hit my scroll button, sorry about that. Halfway is going to be at a height of negative 1, and at 0, you're 0. Halfway, you're at 1, two thirds of the way. You're at 1.7, and actually, what happens as you get closer and closer to this asymptote, you uh, to this vertical line here, it becomes an asymptote, meaning it, it approaches closer and closer and closer, but never actually touches it. Same thing's going to happen as we come this way. And just to give you an idea of of how this thing is drawn, it does not flatten out at the middle. It's actually this. Uh, direction here is at about a 45 degree angle where it crosses the x-axis and the y-axis in fact.
Now just like the sine function and the cosine function, the tangent function is going to repeat itself as you move from left to right on the x-axis. You're going to see every um, length pi, that is starting at pi over 2 until you get to positive, negative pi over 2 until you get to positive pi over 2, you see these two asymptotes and you see the curve progress through there much like what we drew on the previous page. But then it starts over and again from pi over 2 now to 3 pi over 2 you'll have the curve trace itself out but will also be undefined at 3 pi over 2 um, and so forth as you go back to the left which means we can identify some properties based on this graph that repeats itself the domain is now not the same as the sine and the cosine function because you have these places here 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 where I've got the dotted lines where it's undefined. There are no values for the function there, so you cannot plug in, for example, negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. It is all real numbers except the odd multiples of pi over 2. The range, now interestingly enough, is all real numbers because if you look at the heights that this thing hits on the y-axis, it actually will go to every possible height because this thing goes all the way up and all the way down. So it covers the entire y-axis vertically. So the range is all real numbers. Now tangent, is it odd or even? Remember if it's even, it's a mirror image across the y-axis. Now it's odd if it's a mirror image and it flips, right? Which is exactly what happens here. Is that it is a mirror image across here but then flips vertically about the x-axis. So if you go over this direction you're up, if you go over this direction you're down, but all these the exact same amount on either side. So that makes it an odd function. It is also periodic, but notice how long does it take for the function to repeat itself. In previous values, or previous functions, it took 2 pi for it to repeat itself, but now we see that it actually repeats itself after only pi. The x-intercepts, you can see from the graph, are negative 2 pi, negative pi, 0 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on in each direction, and the y-intercept is at the origin and the vertical asymptotes which is a word I think we've covered before but if we haven't um, just think of asymptotes as those things that the curve approaches but never crosses the or never actually reaches the vertical asymptote occur at these values that's where I've drawn my little arrows across the bottom now to do the cotangent function I've taken the liberty of going ahead and in your notes filling in these values because you could continue the same process that we have done already with the tangent function and identify what these points are now you'll notice I've started from pi over 6 and gone up to 5 pi over 6 and the reason is because for the cotangent function its horizontal angles that is the 0 and the pi angle that are undefined because cotangent of a theta angle is x over y. So whenever y is 0 is what we're going to have undefined values. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at just the top half. And then what we'll see is that it repeats itself for the bottom half as well. So it turns out that 0 is an asymptote for cotangent and so is pi for that reason. And as you progress across here what ends up happening is when you get to pi over 2, you're at a height of 1. If you split this in half, you're down at negative 1. Actually, you're at positive 1, I'm sorry. And negative 1. This does not need to be there. And then as you get closer, this thing is going to drop down this way. And as you get closer this way, it's going to go up. So the curve is basically like the tangent in that it approaches its asymptotes only it's shifted and reflected about the x-axis. It occurs from 0 to pi. That is, that's where that one 
curve appears and will repeat itself as you extend in the um, left and right directions on the x-axis, like this. Notice how the asymptotes will occur at 0 pi, 2 pi, negative pi, negative 2 pi, and so on. The x-intercepts are going to be at the middle of each of those intervals, and it's going to go always downhill for cotangent. Tangents are always going uphill, cotangents are going downhill, but the same basic shape. Now I just want to discuss by looking at it what the graph of the cosecant function and the secant function look like. Remember that cosecant of x is the same thing as 1 over sine of x. So if you look at the graph that I have here, and I'll go ahead and just highlight it for you, this graph right here is what function? All right, that's the sine wave, right? Now to figure out what the cosecant graph would look like, just think of any point on that curve. For example, let's look at this point right here. The height right there is 1. That's for sine, right? So the height for the cosine or cosecant would be 1 over 1, which happens to be the same thing. That's why these points right here are all shared, because 1 and 1 over 1 are the same thing. 1 over negative 1. 1 and, sorry, negative 1 and 1 over negative 1 are the same. That's why these points occur on both sine and cosecant. But if you look at, say, for example, this value of x right here, now let me draw in red what the sine function looks like. The sine is this height, right? So that height right there, I'll draw it with an arrow, is sine of x. Now if you have a number that's less than 1, and you take 1 over that number, you get a number that's greater than 1. So at that same place of x, now if I go all the way up to here, that height is 1 over sine of x, which is taller. And so what you see is you move down this way on the sine function, your cosecant shoots up this way. And as you move down this way, 1 over each of those heights shoots up this way. Again, the reasoning goes back to the fact that if you take a number like a half and you do 1 over a half, you get 2. You get a number bigger than 1. A number less than 1, take its reciprocal, you get a number bigger than 1. And the closer the number is to 0, the bigger the reciprocal will be. Until you reach this kind of point right here, which is a problem, right? What is sine of pi? It's 0, right? So it's cosecant of pi just pi, right? It's undefined because you can't do 1 over 0. That's why there's an asymptote at every pi because those are the y-intercepts for, sorry, the x-intercepts for sine. Those are the places where the height of the sine function is 0. And if you try to do 1 over 0, you're always going to be undefined. So you can always figure out what the cosecant looks like by taking the sine function and then going to each of the highest and lowest points and drawing these big U's, and everywhere the sine function is zero is going to be an asymptote. The exact same process will work for secant, keeping in mind that if you start with this function, which happens to be the cosine function, that the secant function is 1 over cosine. So same idea, you, you look at all of their highest and lowest points, that's going to be a point that's shared on the graph for the sine and the cosine, or for the cosine and the secant, and then everywhere that the cosine function crosses the x-axis has to be a vertical asymptote, has to be a place where the secant function is undefined. Now if you start here and go up and up, there's that what your secant function look like. All right, and so that's the basic concept behind looking at the tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and secant 
graphs. Just want you to be able to visualize what those graphs look like um, by walking through some of the properties that you see those curves have. And that's the end of Lecture 12.